as the world pauses. On the anniversary of the celebration of your birth, you have come to us. You promised to return. In an undeniable way, you were made flesh and blood like us. And so let us come to the manger this day to bend the knees of our hearts that we would worship the King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, in whose name we gather and sing and live, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things I enjoy this time of year is looking into some of the poems that are collected and gathered and shared and endured over decades, sometimes centuries, about this whole event, the coming of Jesus. One of them, written by Ralph Lewin, puts it this way, talking about no room for Mary and Joseph no room. No room, the agent said. You should have booked some weeks ahead. According to the tourist's guide, we're always full at Christmas time. The infant quickened in the womb, yet still the agent said, no room. There were no vacancies at all, except in someone's ox's stall. And there foretold and yet forlorn the Savior of the world, Born. For there was shelter, after all, in someone's humble ox's stall. The oxen left some fragrant hay, whereupon the virgin mother lay, and it was really God for whom the beasts had made a little room. A number of years ago, I ventured to set up a place of respite for our young childless family, pre-kids, BC, kids start with a K, whatever. But I set this place up, and I said, we're gonna go, it's gonna be awesome, it's in the northern woods of Minnesota, it's June, what could go wrong? A little cabin, actual wood cabin, full logs, the whole deal. This is before the internet existed, so I couldn't go online and kind of check it out, nor did I bother getting a travel brochure or any pictures of this place until we got there. The Honeymoon Cottage, on Lake Vermilion, by the way, looked okay at first, you know, passable. Then, it, as we got further into it, a little disappointing. And by the third day, it was downright dangerous. We left early. It was infested with mice, which we didn't find until we started cooking something, along with the mice in the oven. And we moved to another cabin, and I think there were stains on the mattress. I'm not even sure. It wasn't good. The Motel 6 looked better. Our retreat. I think about that, and I feel, I felt maybe like a little bit like Joseph then. Not real good at providing, or at least feeling like a failure. In that sense. With his beloved Mary. His pregnant fiance Mary. Settling for a stable out back to give birth to her only, her firstborn there, the son that they had by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, the righteous and upstanding follower of God, chosen for this mission. I wonder how he felt. You ever thought about him? I mean, the holiday leans real heavily toward the manger and Mary. Well, what about Joseph? The virgin Joseph, as we'll look, see in a minute. He can teach us quite a few things, I think, about leading a life with God, kind of before, during, and after. He was with God, righteous, the Bible tells us, and upstanding, a follower. You see, when he sees Jesus eventually, and we'll talk about that, he sees God saves. That's the name, Jesus, Yeshua, God saves. Joseph sees that. He had seen it before, but now it was right there. Undeniable. He's kind of an ornament, in a way, in the Christmas pageant. Kind of to the side. Not a lot of 
maybe a few, but not a lot of boys are like, I want to be Joseph. Right? I mean, the, the coveted role for the girls is Mary. I'll be Mary. Or I'll, shepherds, they're cool. Maybe a lamb. I don't know if anybody's, I'll be Joseph. You know, that silent companion off to the side, next to Mary, who just simply says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to you according to your word. Right? Surrender. And her surrender changes the world forever. That's who Joseph is next to. The Virgin Mary. He is the Virgin Joseph, Joseph though. We'll look at that. And he does kind of seem like this utilitarian sort of, you know, less important, but okay guy. Part of the, part of the pageant, the drama, God's drama, really, to bring Emmanuel to us. So we'll think about him a little bit today, Christmas Day. How God used him, how God will use you. Why did the Virgin Joseph drag his pregnant fiance all the way to Bethlehem on the back of a donkey? She didn't have to go, by the way. Augustus was not requiring that she be counted for the census. There's no papers for her to sign. It's, it's Joseph's deal. It was always the men's deal to be counted, to be in census. Ever wondered why then he drags her all the way to Bethlehem? Away from her family? I mean, I thought it was bad enough to make the 20-minute drive in the minivan for a couple of hours. But no, here they go. On the back of a donkey, tradition tells us. Joseph does this because it's what God told him to do. He listened to what the angel tells him in a dream, and it was not his first plan. We'll see that in a minute. God reverses his idea. His decision to dismiss her quietly, to call off the wedding... It was a scandal. And if Joseph would have followed through with it, Jesus would not have been born in Bethlehem of Judea, as the prophets foretold, but in Nazareth, where he grew up, where he was from, where Joseph was from. See, God sometimes turns things 180 degrees around for us. We're heading this way, or we're already on our way, and God says, I want you to go in the other direction. He does that to Joseph and his plan to dismiss her quietly. He had an honor to protect. He was a Jewish man. His betrothed was expecting. She was pregnant. That wasn't good. How else could that happen except, we all know, right, by another man? How else? And it wasn't happening weekly, this immaculate conception. It was... We knew, we knew how those things, they knew how those things happened. But he was righteous, and he would honor God above all things. And so he decides to put her away quietly. He could have done it publicly, but he doesn't. Could have had her stoned, because they used to do that. See, that's the kind of world to which Jesus comes. A world where the law is observed, and it is unbreakable. And it, can, it decides what you will do. Jesus comes to fulfill the law and to break his bondage. We'll talk about that. Because Joseph's direction, the one that turned him completely around, comes from God through an angel in a dream. This poor, tormented fellow, caught between love and likely affection for Mary, to be sure, even if it was an arranged marriage, which it probably was, and his devotion to keep the law of God to follow what he was supposed to follow according to the book that he knew. But see, this is all part of God's design to reverse, to turn it around and use it, to bend the laws of nature so that he could break the chains of bondage. See, until you can come to believe in God's ability and willingness to change things, to change the world itself, it will be hard for you to believe that he can change you. So let's believe it today. Open your Bibles up if you have them to Matthew chapter 1. If you don't, we'll put them on the, we'll put the verses on the screen. If you know Matthew's gospel at all, there are several layers of genealogy, generations upon generations. You can see those names. They go back. If you know the Old Testament, those are very familiar folks. And then it comes all the way down to verse 16 of chapter 1, if you've got that, and we find Joseph. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Notice 
notice that? The husband of Mary. She's already mentioned. And Mary was the mother of, you know, Jesus, who was called the Messiah. That's how we introduce ourselves to Joseph. Verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was found to be, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph woke up. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and she gave him, and he gave him the name Jesus. So the Virgin Mary gave birth to a child with no earthly father. You know this. The Virgin Joseph named the child Jesus, whose names mean whose name meant means God saves. Yeshua in Hebrew. Sooner or later, every person born since and living today and born until Jesus returns will call him Emmanuel, God with us. See, the baby grew in Mary's womb. Joseph secures a room for, the, for it to happen. And when Joseph gives Mary his family name, it's much more than a kind of gesture. He is doing the work of God. It protected her from the fear that he would just reject her outright or divorce her or put her away and God's plans would have collapsed. It brings her to Bethlehem, the city of David. <coughs> it made Jesus more than a baby born to a virgin and that was enough. It made him the king, the new king. So if Mary's willing to give birth to a child conceived in her by the Holy Spirit and if Joseph is obedient to give him the name Jesus as directed by God, what will you call him? Will you call him Emmanuel, God with us? Will you call Jesus friend, savior, companion, helper? Because in a lot of ways we're like Joseph. We have to decide what to do with this. Because we can't give birth. I can't give birth. That would be a miracle. That would get in the papers. Men take up hobbies instead because we can't, right? We just try to create stuff. And it's okay. We do okay with it. But there's nothing like giving birth. That's a God thing. And Joseph stands and watches the miracle. Kind of like that poor crumpled kid in the Christmas pageant wearing that baggy bathrobe, holding on to a fake donkey's halter. There he is, poor Joseph, kind of sagging next to the Virgin Mary, giving birth a miracle, God with us happening right before his eyes. Can you imagine the miracle in front of us, in front of him, is happening? But we're a lot like Joseph. We're really more fans than players, you'd say, I'd say. We're kind of like that third shift ER doctor sort of filling in between all kinds of stuff that happens overnight, stitching up folks. But it's not bad to be a Joseph. Because you stand next to a miracle. And it changes you. As Mary gives birth to the Son of God, as Joseph's, you get to name him Jesus and call him Emmanuel. That's us. Emmanuel. God with us. God with you. So Jesus was a common name. There, weren't, there were other Jesuses around, but to call him Emmanuel meant something else. That was a title. And if you look in the prophecy in Isaiah, if you go back to chapter 7, verse 14, which Matthew picks up, it's interesting that Matthew records it by saying, they shall call him Emmanuel. In, originally, in Isaiah, it doesn't say they. He changes the singular to the plural. Okay, 
big deal. Actually, it is. You can't be a Christian by yourself. There is no such thing as a solitary Christian. That's how the prophecy, they will, he will be called Emmanuel, turns into they will call him Emmanuel. The first they is Joseph and Mary. The rest of the they, you and I, that's us. And every child born until he comes back, we will call him Emmanuel. Even those who may not believe in him will call him God with us when he comes back. It includes everyone. Today, Christmas Day, when the world actually stops and there's something happening. The Christians gather and they sing and they call him Emmanuel and it makes a difference believing that God has acted through this humble couple by their obedience a couple of millennia ago. We still talk about it today. It wasn't a big event per se. Okay, the birth of a child in a place far away. A no-name place called Bethlehem. Yep, whatever. It's a big deal though. Changed the world, didn't it? Did it change you? Because I'm here to declare for you on this Christmas day that God will not forget anyone who calls him Emmanuel. God with us. The truth of Christmas Day is this. God is with you. God is with you, not just today on a dressed up beautiful day in church with all kinds of poinsettias and a Christmas tree and maybe a nice meal today. He's with you everywhere you go. Wherever you find yourself. Physically, spiritually, mentally, Financially, He is there with you. Someone put it this way, when it comes down to it, we're probably less concerned about the fact that God is everywhere, which God is, and more with the fact that knowing that God is where I am, where you are. In the situations you find yourself, he said it's less important that God can be accessed from anywhere, though that's true, kind of 911, where you're at, God, and the fact that God can be found where you are laugh and cry and whimper and whine and giggle and shout and sing where you slumber, where you rage and rant. That's where God is. Where you pray. He's there. That's what this means. Emmanuel. His common name, Jesus. Yep, that's right. His symbolic name, Emmanuel. God with you. Inside. Pervasive. Undeniable tangible, tasteable in Holy Communion the day after tomorrow, right here, if he doesn't come back tomorrow, taste him, come back. Audible, you can hear him. Concrete, you can build on him. Undeniable, he's flesh and blood like you are, like I am. You see, this single miraculous birth of this single child born 20 centuries ago to this little Jewish couple changed everything. And he will keep changing everything until he comes again. Those shepherds jarred from their sleep. The angels who exploded with praise because they had nothing, they could do nothing less when the sun was born. A star itself stood watch over this little town called Bethlehem. Because of that, everything changes. The warring madness will one day end. Even as it continues this day, it will end one day. We can set our differences aside. We can entertain forgiveness for all our relationships as more than a visitor, but as a permanent fixture in our hearts. Unsinkable hope, boundless joy, love that has no limits or conditions. This is Emmanuel. This is what it means. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I love him. Do you? More than a child. God with us. So will you rekindle with me today, Christmas Day, this year, the end of this year and into the next year, if we live that long? A love for the one born to the humble couple who listened and obedient to God's prophecy, obeyed and brought about the salvation of the world. Will you bend your knee with me at the manger? As I said, some poems say it best. 
This one is from about 1973. The poet's name is Ron Klug, and he started thinking about what Joseph's life was like and what he might have been pondering. We know Mary pondered. I'm thinking Joseph did too. So he put pen to paper, and he wrote this about Jesus, the infant. Sleep now, little one. Sleep. I'll watch while you and your mother sleep. I wish I could do more. This straw is not good enough for you. Back in Nazareth, I'll make a proper bed for you of seasoned wood, smooth, strong, well paved. A bed fit for a carpenter's son. Just wait till we get back to Nazareth. I'll teach you everything I know. You'll learn to choose the cedar wood, eucalyptus, and fir. You'll learn to use the draw shave, the axe, and saw. Your arms will grow strong. Your hands will get rough like these. You will bear the pungent smell of new wood, and your shavings and sawdust will be in your hair. You'll be a man whose life centers on hammer and nails and wood. But for now, for now, sleep, little Jesus, sleep. I imagine he did. Jesus slept that night, but his rest would not last, would it? He had a singular mission, not far removed from the tools of Joseph's trade, nails and wood and a hammer that would be used not to build at the end of his life, his earthly life, a crib or a table, but a kingdom established by the cross. The promise of new heaven and a new earth, a cradle for our hearts, that we would slumber securely forever and one day wake to the glory of God and see the face of Jesus before us. That's what Jesus was building with his very life. My favorite verse for Christmas I'll share with you as we close is not from Luke or Matthew or Isaiah, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, displayed in the face of Christ. As the world stops today, as you put your world on pause to see the face of Christ, to welcome forgiveness and hope and contentment and joy into every crevice of your life so that your hearts would not be troubled, that you would believe in God, that you would believe also in Jesus. I invite you again to bow at the manger, confident that your life is purchased and paid for at the cross, and rise with us to serve him the rest of your days, to join in this carpenter's son's work, to build a kingdom on the firm foundation of obedience to God, grounded in truth, because it will cost you nothing more than your entire life, which isn't yours in the first place, by the way. Because even the grace of God does mean we get a free pass, but the mercy of God compels us that if we truly believe in Jesus, if we follow him and give him our entire hearts, we have nothing to lose and the entire kingdom of God to gain and none of us will be able to resist his boundless love. Merry Christmas.